before we understand what is Hadoop, we need to have a fair bit of understanding about what is this distributed computing all about. This actually will give us a solid understanding of where did Hadoop start from. So where does Hadoop actually have its root from? It's all from distributed computing or simply called as parallel processing in the computing circles. Let's try to take a real world example. So you have a living room uh, which needs to be painted. What would you do? You would just hire a painter who approximately would take uh, two hours to finish the paint job of one surface. Now you have five uh, surfaces which to be painted. That is your four walls and one ceiling. If that person is working non-stop, it would take 10 hours to complete the paint job. Suppose what would you do if you want the paint job to be completed in under three hours? It's a heuristic approach or simple common sense approach that you would hire more and more painters. If you would hire five different painters to work on each individual surface, the paint job would be completed in under three hours. So is the case of many problem, sol problem solving in computer science. Let's assume we have a problem. Uh, the data set actually is going to be numbers or it is separated by commas or a CSV file. The file size is one GB. And then you have a PC or which typically a desktop or a laptop, which has a piece of software, which can scan all the numbers one by one in this file. And then the program is typically going to just add up all the numbers in that file. Let's assume for the sake of discussion that this operation on a single system is going to take 50 seconds to produce a sum, say the sum of all the numbers in this one GB file is 10,000. Now, the same problem can actually be solved much faster by dividing that single file into two halves, not necessarily two equal halves, but approximately two equal halves, and providing them to two identical computers in terms of their hardware configuration. And both these computers actually have the same kind of software, which typically adds up all the numbers in these two files and each computer is producing the results individually. And then you have the third computer, which is acting as a coordinator to sum up the individual results produced by all the computers and then give the result to you. If you would notice, the previous single computer actually took 50 seconds to find the sum. In this case, we are taking 30 seconds, approximately almost half the time. Where is this extra five seconds going? You might have a question in your mind that, hey, my single computer solved the problem in 50 seconds. Why can't two computers solve it in 25 seconds? Of course, yes, that five seconds overhead is for this third computer to actually coordinate among all the other systems to collect the results, sum it up and give it back to you. So this little bit of overhead time is spent in communicating and coordinating the results produced by the individual computers. Now, this is the very fundamental idea of parallel processing, where you divide the data and give it to multiple systems and then perform the computations on multiple systems, get the individual results in pieces and sum them up and give the results back to the user. However, the challenge is not all kinds of problems can be solved like this. In this example, we took a small example of, you know, finding the sum of all the numbers. So there are a particular kind of computing uh, problems or in terms of algorithms, we call them as divide and conquer type problems. So many of the searching and sorting type of problems fall under this category of divide and conquer algorithms. And all these problems which come under the category of divide and conquer can be parallelized, meaning they can be solved much faster if you have multiple resources or multiple computing systems working on them at a time. But this idea of parallel processing is not something new. They have been existing since almost as early as 1970s. It's hard to believe, right? Yes, and those kind of computing environments were actually called as supercomputers. And a supercomputer is typically nothing but several individual computers hooked up by networking cables. So you can see this image where you have a lot of networking engineers working on hooking up multiple individual systems arranged in cupboard-like structures called as racks. And you would require an army of network engineers and system administrators to actually keep this kind of a supercomputer, supercomputing system up and running. And what are these companies, IBM, Fujitsu, Cray, Intel, these were all the major companies. And even today, these are all the, the, the major market leaders in manufacturing supercomputers. There are still many research organizations which still uh, continue to use these kind of infrastructure, which is called as supercomputers. Now, what were the kind of uh, computing use cases or the business use cases of 
which needed supercomputers were like weather forecasting and uh, a, a US Department of Defense or any other developed nations uh, defense related computational work required this computational intensive task on large data sets. For example, if you want to uh, project, uh, if you want to have a projection of the missile trajectory, this is a pretty, you know, computationally intensive task where data is coming from several sources. Or if you want to analyze the data sent out by the satellites for weather forecasting. So these are all computationally intensive tasks on large data sets. So these kind of organizations like NASA, US Department of Defense, the Homeland Security, or the weather forecasting companies, they all used supercomputers because one thing, they had big data, they had a need for it, and they were also super cash rich organizations. We try to discuss about supercomputers, but they do have a fair bit of challenge. First thing is the cost. Supercomputers are like damn expensive. They can actually cost you millions of dollars. And a supercomputer is nothing but interconnected grid of several individual systems. And they pretty much have a very close uh, relation with the vendors, meaning if something is broken, if some entity is broken in, in, in any of your supercomputing nodes or any of your individual computer is broken, you have to approach the single vendor like the IBM or the Fujitsu or Cray or the Intels, whoever they are. And that's where it's going to be uh, pretty expensive. You cannot actually customize individual components of your supercomputer if you're purchasing it from a single vendor. So owning the hardware infrastructure is a pretty expensive affair. And maintaining it, you need to have a pretty decent amount of well-qualified network engineers and system engineers, or typically the Unix administrators to actually keep things going. And another big challenge is there is no readily available off-the-shelf distributed operating system. What do I mean by distributed operating system is that it's not a standalone system like your desktop or your laptop where you can run by installing Ubuntu or some flavor of Linux or some uh, Windows operating system or some Apple based operating system or that. This is now a computing cluster consisting of hundreds of machine. Each machine needs to have something like an operating system on top of which there needs to be uh, another piece of software to coordinate and speak to all the machines and make the entire cluster work as a single unit. So this is actually pretty much called as a distributed operating system. And there is no readily available uh, distributed operating system. At least there needs to be a fair amount of customization which needs to be done, even if there is an open source distributed operating system available in the market. So many companies which actually try to own the supercomputing clusters need to have their own software engineering team to build this customized distributed operating system to keep this entire cluster up and running. So there is a hardware upfront infrastructure cost in terms of investing in procuring a supercomputer. And there is there needs to be an army of network engineers to maintain it. And it needs to be a team of software engineers to continuously uh, keep uh, applying the bugs and patches in case if they keep arising in the course of operating operation of a supercomputer. So the operating system has to be custom designed and the bug fixes also has to be maintained. So these are all the challenges in terms of maintaining a, a supercomputer and keeping it up and running. So all the challenges what we actually discussed with the, the supercomputing environment is pretty much taken care by this uh, software called as Hadoop. So most of you must have actually at least heard this term called as Hadoop. So what is this Hadoop? This Hadoop is basically a software, a piece of software which you need to install on multiple systems, which is already interconnected by means of networking infrastructure. So this Hadoop, the first thing it's free of cost, it's open source. And then it gives you an environment for parallel processing. It gives a feel of uh, a distributed and distributed operating system. But however, Hadoop is not a full fledged distributed operating system. It already sits on a host operating system, which can be Windows or Linux based operating system, which is already pre installed on every computer, which is belonging to a part of a cluster. So the advantage of this is because it's free and it's open source, many mid sized organizations are able to build their own cluster cluster meaning it's a setup consisting of multiple interconnected computers. So something like a small supercomputer might not be as powerful and as fast as a commercially available supercomputer, which is sold from the major giants like IBM and Fujitsu and Craze. But depending upon your budget, depending upon your needs and use cases, you can build a small cluster, which is going to be at least 10 times or a few hundred times more powerful than solving the same problem on a standalone system. And 
the software updates which actually come as a part of Hadoop is again free of cost so you don't have to maintain an in-house team of qualified software engineers to take care of the bug fixes and software patches pretty much it's all available free of cost so that's why Hadoop actually is pretty popular and that's when people in the industry started creating a lot of noise around Hadoop because now you have the data you're able to store the data and now you have a pretty economical means of actually you know analyzing the data and Hadoop does not demand you to actually procure the hardware infrastructure from a single vendor if you want to have a hundred systems interconnected or a hundred nodes in your cluster the word node here stands for an individual system in your cluster a cluster is basically a group of multiple machines interconnected so there is no hard and fast rule what at Hadoop actually tries to say you have to purchase all the computers from one vendor so you can pretty much build your own hardware and it can come from multiple vendors in that case the companies don't have to feel the pinch of paying huge amount of premium to a single vendor in case something is broken so that's where Hadoop is pretty much friendly in setting up the hardware infrastructure at the same time in terms of software it's absolutely free of cost so what are the roots of Hadoop actually? In fact, uh, Hadoop is a distributed parallel processing framework or simply a parallel processing framework which facilitates distributed computing. The roots actually started from the internet search engines. In fact, the idea of Hadoop originated from the internet search engines. So I hope many of you wouldn't have heard about these kind of companies like AskJeeves.com or Likehoos or AltaVista. These were all very popular search engines remember these days search engines are actually embedded into the browsers as a tab but earlier search engines were actually uh, separate files which you had to download and install in your windows operating system and these were the examples and right now only yahoo many people might remember and i am pretty sure many people would not even use yahoo for their search engine purposes pretty much it's google if it's the word google is synonymous with search engines so back in the early uh, 2000s and late 90s, when internet actually was getting built block by block, these were the companies which actually made a huge amount of money because they were pretty popular. Yahoo was very, very popular back then, and Google was never there in the picture at all. And look at what has happened in just 10 years from 2000 onwards. Google is dominating this internet search engine space, and if it is search engine, Google is pretty much synonymous with search engine space. So it was pretty much back in the early 2000s, when these two people, Duff Cutting and uh, Mike Caffarella, they were working on an internet search engine project called as Nutch. And that was when Google actually was in its infancy stage and they were working on building their own search engine. They were publishing quite a bit of white papers. And these two people were inspired by some of the ideas from the Google's white papers and they built something similar to that. And one of the guys, Duff Cutting, moved on to Yahoo. And in the year 2006, officially, Yahoo rolled out the stable version of Hadoop. And from 2006 onwards, 2007 period, it has become an open source project which is maintained by this Apache uh, Software Foundation or Apache.org is the official website where you can go and download a copy of your Hadoop for free of cost. So here we are from 2006 until this point of time, there are three major Hadoop releases, Hadoop 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 in the market available. The most stable one is Hadoop version 2, which is also called as MR2 or YAN. To summarize, we try to understand the very basic idea of what is parallel processing and what kind of problems actually can be solved using parallel processing. Why do we need this parallel processing infrastructure? And how old is this idea of parallel processing in terms of supercomputers? What are the challenges of supercomputers? And how is Hadoop actually coming to the rescue in terms of both hardware infrastructure as well as the software which is free of cost?